labor and rest laboring in god's kingdom and resting as god wants us to rest now uh, rarely uh, in the evening bible said do i refer to greek words but today i'm going to refer to some greek words because i i feel necessary is necessary to share the greek words when there's a difference in understanding if you don't know the greek word for example and the very often the word worker and laborer are uh, confusing to many people what the bible actually means by laborer we think is a worker a servant works a slave labors and we are called to labor for the lord and uh, we need to understand the difference now in the ninth chapter of matthew the last few verses we read about how jesus when he saw the multitudes he had compassion on them for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd the lord told the disciples the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few pray lord of the harvest will send laborers into the harvest field now some bible say workers said workers is actually laborers the word in greek used there is a word called ergatos ergatos e r g a t s and ergatos means toiler toiling toiling hard working hard a worker may just work a laborer toils and god wants people who will toil in his kingdom so laborer is a toiler and a laborer labors now the word labor interestingly also is a greek word called kopos kopos k o p o s kopos laborer labors worker works and what the meaning of the word kopos you know what it actually means it means pain p a i n taking a beating that's what laboring means now you understand how in english language uh, when uh, expectant mother goes to the labor room what do people say she's gone into labor she's gone into labor labor pains so laboring means taking a beating taking pain so look, apply that in the context of the lord telling his disciples the harvest is plentiful laborers are few god has people who work for him god has people who advise him also there are people who advise god even jeremiah advised god about wicked people flourishing in the world what to do with them there are many people who tell god what god has to do but we are actually slaves of christ doulos the word say a slave is doulos in if you look at romans 11 paul writes i paul a servant of christ some bible say it's actually slave of christ called to be an apostle so god is searching for people in the kingdom who be willing to be toiling for him who take pain who take a beating for the kingdom of god that's the kind of people god is searching for who work hard when you toil we work hard so when we say lord i want to serve you lord be prepared to work hard as god calls us to work for him when god chose people in the bible he always chose people who had the potential to work hard in fact they were working hard even before they were called they got called the while they were working old testament saul what was he doing first samuel 9 chapter he was busy searching for his father's donkeys he took a sound along with him all over they were going looking for donkeys they be lost the donkeys old testament david king david what was he doing when samuel was sent to the household of jesse to anoint one of the sons of jesse david was busy looking after his father's sheep his brothers were in the house first samuel chapter 16 from verse 5 uh, we read brothers were in the house and samuel saw the eldest brother eliab he thought he was going to be god's uh, next king of israel and he went through all the uh, god said no not him and then after going through all the brothers he asked he's asking jesse any other son is there for you say hey, one more is there what's he doing he is looking after the sheep dev was looking after his father's sheep busy taking care of his father's sheep and god called him while he was busy 
New Testament Saul, what was he doing when he was called? He was busy persecuting Christians. Wrong thing he was doing because he was ignorant. He was blinded. I mean, saw so Jesus, he physically became blind also. And the Lord gave him revelation through his physical blindness. And he was busy running behind Christians. There are many people in Jerusalem who were against this group of people calling themselves followers of Christ, what they call the way or the sect. Only Saul went behind them. He was faithful to what he believed to be right. It is wrong what he believed. But he thought it's right and he was doing something about it. He was serious about it. He went behind Christians, working hard to arrest Christians, put them in prison. And later on, he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 onwards. I thank Christ Jesus, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. He considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Meaning, while I was busy persecuting Christians, the Lord realized that I am faithful to whatever I believe. He saw that in my heart. And then he called me, gave me strength to serve him. So God wants people who are willing to work hard, labor for him. And this motivation to labor for the Lord actually comes from love for God. Because we love him, we labor. That's why when you love God and serve uh, him and obey him, the two, two expressions of love for God actually, one is to obey him. In John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. The other expression of love for God is serving God's people because we love God. Remember the time when the Lord restored Peter to the ministry, to the fellowship with God. Peter had gone fishing after Christ was crucified, resurrected. He had gone fishing. 25th chapter of John, we read, very familiar story. When the Lord talks to Simon, son of Jonah, and asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? You know, I love you, Lord. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. In other words, if you love me, you will take care of my people. And in the ministry, we are all called to serve people. We glorify God through our ministries and serve people. Every servant of God is called to serve his people. And we are called to be people who are not lorded over them, but serve them. Serve them. The apostle Paul understood that in his heart. Not only he knew it, every Christian is supposed to know that. A leader in the servant of God is a servant. He's supposed to know that. But the Apostle Paul not only knew it and believed it, he actually preached it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, he writes, We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. We preach ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. So when we serve God, offer ourselves to God as a servant, he'll make us servants of people. And we serve people, we labor in the vineyard out of love for God. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul writes, The love of God compels me. The love of God constrains me. He says, I'm constrained by the love of God to share the gospel, to do whatever God has called him to do. And if you look at his life and ministry, it's amazing, isn't it? What all things he went through in the ministry. Read in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, from verse 24, he talks about how five times he received the 50, 40 lashes minus one. 40 lashes minus one. 40 was the maximum they're supposed to lash in the Old Testament time. Just to make sure they may not make a proper count, they stopped with 39. The Jews, 40 minus 1, 39 lashes. In case they go beyond 40, they'll be punished. So to make sure they don't go above 40, they lash 39 times. So five times Paul received the 40 lashes minus 1. 
Three times he is beaten with rods. Once he was stoned. Three times shipwrecked. In danger in the sea. Danger because of bandits. Danger because of Gentiles. Danger because of his own countrymen. Sleepless nights he also had. Hunger, thirst, went without food. He went through all that because the love of God compels him. God loves every one of us. But do every one of us love God the same way? Same way like God who loves us, we cannot love. But do you love God the way other people in the world, Christians, love God? Like how Paul loved God. Ask God for that love. Love is given to us by him. And first of all, we are called to love him, love God. All our heart, soul, mind and strength. And if you tell him, Lord, I love you, Lord. He'll say, okay, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. And when we go about serving God's people because we love God, we will never lose the zeal to serve God. We never lose zeal. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work or the love you have shown him as you help his people and continue to help them. Now, this capacity to work hard and labor is the grace of God. God gives us grace to be able to work hard. All he wants from us is willingness. Willingness to work hard for him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, Paul writes, By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God working within me. God gives us grace. Strength is his grace. Wisdom is his grace. Every good gift God gives us is by grace. We can't earn these gifts. We receive them. So God gives us grace to be able to work hard to receive more grace, to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Now, I'm called to be a preacher and a teacher and a counselor, encourager from God's word. My ministry is primarily the word ministries. That's why it's called Logos Ministries. Logos means word. Now, if God has called me to do uh, this kind of ministry, he will justify the calling by giving me the resources to do it. He will teach me the scriptures. But I must work hard to receive the scriptures, to be taught by him. There's a point of time when people are following Jesus physically because they've been fed with bread and fish. More than 5,000 people were fed by him with five loaves of bread and two fish. And when they're all following him because they wanted food, he tells them in John 6, 27, do not work for food that spoils. Bread spoils ultimately. Don't last two days. Don't work for food that spoils. But for food that endures to eternal life. That is the word of God. 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven, earth will pass away, my word will never pass away. What endures forever is the word of God. And for that, we are supposed to work hard. He will teach us. Yes, that's his grace. He will teach us the word. John 14, 26. He will remind us of the word. John 14, 26. He will give us the words to speak to people. 1 Corinthians 2.13. But then we must be taught by him. So personally for me, since my calling is this, all of us, because we are supposed to obey God's word, we should listen to God's word. In my case, I listen, I also have to speak. So I, have, I listen to him to understand myself, apply myself and then share the word. But I must work hard. Nobody can know the Bible completely. I am still a student of the Bible. Every time I read, every time I think, I, something God speaks and it's so exciting. So, hard work. And Paul says, yes, his grace, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace to me was not without effect. I worked hard. This work is hard work, but enjoyable work. We enjoy doing it. 
because we are investing in eternity. Look at the beatings that uh, Paul took. In fact, one point writes in uh, uh, Galatians 6, 17, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He must have scars in his body. And he went on ministering, not deterred by opposition and, 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 and persecution. At one point of time, he writes to the Colossians, again, it was a verse very difficult for some people to understand. In Colossians 1.24, he writes, Colossians 1.24, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking, the sufferings of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I fill up in my flesh. In his flesh, he had wounds. He had troubles. He beat, beat him up. He had stoned. Five times 40 lashes minus one. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in the sufferings of Christ. What is lacking in the sufferings of Christ? On the cross, he finished everything. He accomplished salvation on the cross for everybody. But everybody doesn't know that. 2,000 years back, he died for the sins of the whole world. That the purpose of his sacrifice on the cross. That all of all mankind can receive this grace and be saved and go to heaven. For everybody he died. First Timothy, sorry, first John, first John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. So he died to redeem mankind, whole of mankind, for the sins of the whole world. Till such time the whole world comes to know about it. Something is lacking in his purpose of his dying. It's not fulfilled completely. He did his part. But people don't know. And that's where we come in. And Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. People don't know about this salvation. He died for them. As someone said, many years back, when Princess Diana died, everyone knew about it. Within half an hour, all news channels, everyone, whole world knew Princess Diana died. She died for her own sins. Could we also die for her own sins only? Christ died for our sins. After 2,000 years, how many people know about it? And still such time, they all come to know something is lacking in the purpose of his dying on the cross. And Paul said, I fulfill my flesh, what is still lacking. I go around telling, sharing the gospel. I, can't, I cannot but share the gospel. I'm a debtor to people. That's what he says. All because of his understanding of the scriptures, understanding of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and realizing that he's a co-laborer with God. You know, Bible says, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, he says, we are co-laborers with God. Co-laborers. When the Lord actually walked this earth, you know, he labored. He labored. In John 5, 17, John writes, John 5, 17, Jesus is quoting Jesus. My father's work to this very day, and I too am working. Who's saying that? Jesus is saying that. My father is at work to this very day, and I too am working. So we should also be working, fulfilling his purpose for our lives. And when he actually ministered on this earth for three and a half years, the three and a half years changed the whole world, his ministry. Three and a half years in history, how impactful it is. In the three and a half years, he worked so hard. At one point of time, he says in the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, from verse 20, that he went to somebody's house, ministry, and a large crowd came there. And then he had not eaten. He had not had a food. When the family came to know about it, his mother and brothers came to know about it. He had four brothers, actually. James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And he had some sisters. They came there because he is not eaten, working so hard. And then they actually reached the, reach the place. They sent a messenger into the house to send for uh, Jesus to call him. And the, this person tells Jesus, your mother, brothers have come. And he says, Jesus responds by saying, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He who does the will of God is my mother and father, and my mother and brother and sister. Mother and brother and sister. He worked hard. He had no place to lay his head. Fox have holes, birds have nests, 
for a man has no place to lay his head. He worked very hard. Mark chapter 1, we read from 31 to 35. He had come to the house of uh, Simon Peter in Capernaum. And Peter's mother-in-law was there. She was sick. She had fever. And the Lord uh, touched her and healed her. After he got healed, the Bible said the whole town came to his door. The whole town. At sunset. He began to minister to them at sunset. Can you imagine the whole town at the door at sunset? And he ministered to them. They healed of diseases, healed of demon possession. How long went on, nobody knows. All night they must have gone on. Mark 1.35 says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, left the house, went to a solitary place where he prayed. So hard work. And God gives us strength to work hard because he wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to bear fruit in the ministry. Fruit is born when we are friends of Jesus. John 15 chapter was 15, 16. The Lord says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. For everything I learned from the Father, I made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I wanted you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. God wants all the people to be choosers for ministry. This cho choice is for ministry. It's not for salvation, for ministry. We are all called different ministries. To bear fruit in that, it must be from being a friend of Jesus. To seek his guidance, his wisdom, and his strength. And when you seek him and work hard, we'll prosper. Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 31-21, talks about King Hezekiah. In all that he undertook and served the temple, and obeys the law and the commandments, he sought his God and worked hard, wholeheartedly. So he prospered. He sought his God, worked wholeheartedly, so he prospered. Both are important. Seeking his resources and working hard and we will prosper. So if we feel a little lazy, remember laziness is not from God. He doesn't want us to be lazy. Hebrews 6.12 says, don't be lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise of God. Whatever we have a task given to us, we should work wholeheartedly. In fact, Old Testament itself it says, in the uh, book of Jeremiah, 48 chapter verse 10, woe to him who is lax in doing God's work. Woe to him who is lax. Lax means what? Lethargic, lazy in doing God's work. So please ask God for wisdom, strength, power, love for him. Lord, I want more love for you, that I serve you and I work hard in your kingdom. He wants laborers, ergatas, toilers who toil in God's kingdom. Now let me come next aspect. While we toil for the Lord, the Lord also wants us to have rest. At one point of time, he told the disciples in Mark 6, 31, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me to a quiet place and get some rest. So they all go. When they go there, there's a crowd waiting there and he again ministers. He ministers. They might have had rest. So God wants us to have rest. He's a loving, heavenly father. And his love is much more than a human father, much more than a human mother. We heard when George Matthew was, uh, began the meeting, he referred to this verse in the Bible, Isaiah 49, 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Even though she may forget you, I will not forget you. And his love is much more powerful than any human being can love, any mother can love. And you all know about mothers. They make sure the baby has to sleep and it's time to sleep. Time to play, time to curl around with the baby, time to eat, time to sleep. And sometimes the mother will pat the baby to sleep, sometimes beat the baby to sleep. So much of patting 
and I post the baby to sleep. How much more a heavenly father wants us to rest? While we labor, when he wants us to labor, he wants us to also rest at the right time. We need wisdom for that. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, we read chapter 5, verse 12, written, The sleep of a laborer will be sweet, whether he is eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Let me repeat that. The sleep of a laborer will be sweet, sweet sleep, whether he is little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. When you labor for the Lord, the Lord also say, my child, come rest. I want you to rest. Now, he does not slumber or sleep. Our Lord never slumbers, never sleeps. Psalm 121 verse 2. But he wants us to slumber. He wants us to sleep. He wants to sleep peacefully. In Psalm 4 verse 8, the psalmist writes, Psalm 4 verse 8, I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I lie down and sleep in peace. Only you can make me sleep in peace. Any one of you having lack of sleep, please ask God to give you sleep. He loves to give you sleep. Psalm 127, verse 2 and 3, read. It says, God grants sleep to those whom he loves. He grants sleep to those whom he loves. Sweet sleep, peaceful sleep he'll give you. Source of sleepiness from God. He knows we need to rest. The body needs rest. Body, mind and spirit all need rest. You must know how to sleep. How to sleep biblically. How to rest biblically. Resting in the Lord. So as we realize that God gives us good sleep, He grants sleep to those whom He loves. He loves all of us. Having said that, one word of caution. While he, he grants sleep to those whom he loves, those whom he loves should not love sleep. You don't love sleep. He'll give you sleep when he has to give you sleep. But you should not love sleep. It says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 13, don't, don't love sleep because the bound will come to ruin. You miss out on God's blessings if you sleep too much. So we need wisdom. Not to be lethargic or lazy. Work hard when you have to work hard and rest in him. Have peaceful sleep. Now, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, Proverbs 21, we read, the Solomon writes, Preserve sound judgment and discernment. Preserve sound judgment and discernment. Let them, not out of, let them not be out of your sight. They be life for you. An ornament to grace your neck. They be life for you. Ornament to grace your neck. Grace your neck. Then you go on your way in safety. Your feet will not slip. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Your rest will be sweet. To have sweet sleep, restful sleep, we need discernment. Because you want to sleep biblically, rest after labor in the Lord the whole day. Then all three aspects of the human personality has to be ready for sleep. Body should be ready for sleep. That will happen when you work hard, when you labor for the Lord. Beat your body, make it a slave. You'll be ready for sleep. But not only the body must be ready for sleep, our mind and spirit must be ready for sleep. In many cases, that's not the case. People toss and twist in the bed. No sleep because the spirit and the mind are not ready for sleep. They are troubled. Troubled. Mind is troubled. To have rest, need mind, spirit and body all at rest in the Lord. Now, certain things affect the heart and the mind. What are those things that affect the heart and the mind? What affects the heart is guilt, 
and bitterness. Bitterness affects the heart, affects the mind. Also, guilt. When you have guilt, you can't sleep. Go think about what happened in the past. Night time, when you lie in bed, all the past comes back. Sometimes you feel bad about yourself. You feel bad for what people did to you. And while the body is ready to sleep, heart is not ready. Then what happens? Mind goes on a world tour. Mind has got anxiety. What will happen tomorrow? What will happen day after tomorrow? What will happen in the future? We keep thinking. And mind goes here and there. Then you have anger. Anger also hinders sleep. The same bus which uh, uh, Paul wrote to the, uh, to the uh, Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 26 27, he writes that uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 26 27, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Now, when you have anger in the heart, you can't sleep. Put it away. Otherwise, you know, he says, in, don't let the sun go down while still angry. At night time, make sure there's no anger. In fact, you should immediately repent, immediately put anger behind. Don't wait till sunset. But then what happens is sometimes when the anger in the heart, then you can't sleep. In Psalm 4, verse 4, verse 8, I got told you earlier, verse 8 talks about, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Look at verse 4. In your anger, do not sin. Same thing Paul is quoting to their uh, efficiency, but here, what? how does it go on from verse 4, second part? In your anger, do not sin. When, when you are in your bed, when you are in your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Don't plan iniquity. Don't plan retaliation. Don't plan to harm somebody who spoke badly against you. So, bitterness, guilt, worry, and anger affect the heart and the mind. And so, while your body is you're tired, you want to sleep, but no, no sleep. Twist and toss in the bed. Get up and walk around. Again, think about what happened. All three must be ready for rest. And God will give us the resources. The word of God will teach us to handle every one of this. If you have guilt, or God's word will tell us. Holy Spirit will tell us. Hebrews 10, 22. By his blood, our hearts are purified. And we are cleansed of the guilty conscience. There's no guilty conscience for a Christian because his blood has cleansed of every, every guilty conscience. Bitterness, no question of bitterness because when we forgive, we have to forget. Put the thought behind. Rebook the thought which comes, comes to you about somebody sinning against you. Put away bitterness. Put away guilt. Don't worry about your life because Matthew 6.25 says, don't worry about your life. Jeremiah 29 11 says, Jeremiah 29 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. For every aspect of life is a solution in the Bible. So when you lie on bed at night, after a hard day's work, after laboring in whatever God has called you to do, now this is not only for laboring in God's kingdom, I'm also including. Uh, what a work that you do. See, serving God doesn't necessarily mean you must be in full-time ministry. What a work God has called you to do, you do it sincerely. Colossians chapter 3, 20, 24. Whatever your task, work it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for men. Knowing, you receive the inheritance of God's reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever work we called us to do, God has called us to do, work sincerely, honestly, as unto the Lord. Seek Him and work hard. And like Hezekiah, we will prosper. Working wholeheartedly for the Lord. Now, again, like I said, nighttime, after a hard day's work, about to sleep, the mind is troubled. 
You're not able to rest in the mind. In Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 30, the Lord told the disciples and also others who are there, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Mark the word rest. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Rest for the soul is peace of mind. Soul includes the word soul actually has come from a Greek word called zyke. It means emotions, intellect and the will. Mind, intellect, emotions and the will. Rest. Rest in the Lord. He's carrying between his shoulders. The blessing to Benjamin. Deuteronomy 33 verse 12. Let the beloved Lord rest secure in him. For he shields him all day long. He shields him, protects him. The one whom the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Resting in his arms. Now have you noticed how a mother is holding the baby in the arms. Baby has no cares. Wherever mommy takes, the baby, baby goes. Doesn't look around surroundings. But at home, even though it's home, family surroundings, fan is on, the furniture is very familiar furniture. Mommy goes to the next room, baby cries. Same baby with the mommy's arms outside, no crying. Anywhere you take, won't cry. And the Lord holds us in his arms. We find security in him. Work hard in the kingdom, rest in the Lord. And it says in the Old Testament also, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 15, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And the context here is, the Israelites in Jerusalem were disobeying God and the prophet spoke to them, they said, don't tell all these things. Don't confront the Holy One of Israel. Plus present things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. And stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. The prophet is speaking God's word. People have said, no, no, don't tell us these things. Don't talk about a holy God. Tell us present things. Prophesy illusions. Isaiah chapter 30, 9 to uh, 13. 15th verse, it's written there, yet in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. If only all of us can learn to simply rest in the Lord after working hard, while working, time to rest. Our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. He wants us to slumber and sleep. Not too much of sleep, as much as necessary. There are times in my ministry, my Lord has told me specifically, go to sleep. Go to sleep. Normally, when those days I used to wait uh, for a message before I go and speak, I used to wait, not on the points and all that. And once I was supposed to speak in a meeting, there no, there were no points were there, nothing God spoke. I wanted to uh, wait on the Lord. I fell asleep while preparing and didn't get any message. When I got up, I said, Lord, no message is there. I also go back to sleep. I had to obey God. He knows when we should rest, when we should work hard. And when we work hard, we face difficulties, don't lose that zeal. Romans chapter 12, 11 and 12. Never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. As we labor for the Lord with all the wounds that Paul had, we may not have the same wounds, physical wounds, but we have other wounds, insult, reproach, scoffers, mockers. Look at the Apostle Paul. He faced all this. He persisted in ministry and he knew that as a child of God, he is an heir of God, co-heirs with Christ. In Romans 8, 17 verse, he writes, If you are children, then you are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If we share in his suffering, if we share in his suffering, 
in order to be shared in his glory. So when he go to trials, praise God. At the end of his life, he writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. I've got, I, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now there's a store for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will grant to me on that day. Not only for me, but all who long for his appearing. We have a task before us today to be active in sharing our faith, to work hard, to labor for the Lord, toil for the Lord, take a beating for the Lord, and also take rest in him all the time. And one day when you go to heaven, you'll tell us, God willing, well done, good and faithful servant.